Hello, everyone. Thanks for staying behind, and thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm um, going to talk about uh, type 1 diabetes and low-carbohydrate diets. Um, I'm a, a GP, and I'm also a type 1 uh, with diabetes. And I want to talk about how the low-fat diet has revolutionized my own diabetes management and how this, in turn, affects my approach to patient care. Um, I'm an anecdote, of course. We're all anecdotes, aren't we? Um, so this has to be a personal talk, but I think it is based on sound science. My own regret is that I didn't try it earlier. Uh, I only uh, knew about it two or three years ago, so I'm a little bit of a rookie here, uh, and I stumbled upon it by accident, really. Um, but um, I was really conditioned by the, um, my own profession's sort of um, recommendations on low fat. And I think I, I genuinely felt, really, that it was all about tight control of carbs and insulin, which, of course, it may be for some people who do well. But I, I'm not 100% sure that um, I agree with that now. I should have followed it through at the time, because uh, personally, I, I've always struggled, really, to, to achieve good control by using carbohydrate counting and, and, and insulin injections. But, but change um, takes time sometimes, and it needed um, a nudge to make it happen. Um, the first nudge, really, was that I reached the, 20, reached the 20th anniversary of having my condition, which for me was a big milestone because I felt that, you know, we, we, we're told, aren't we, that, that 20, 25 years after you start um, with diabetes, you start to think about getting complications at least. A lot of people do a lot better than that. But um, it linked together with one or two other things because the prevailing view of the disease is one of inevitable decline. But I, I think I'd challenge that now. But after 20 years of trying to manage, which I now realized was the wrong diet for me personally, I, I knew my body was deteriorating. I think my internal organs must be, what we, um, must be FUBAR, really. Um, the second thing was that I was developing some soft side effects. I think I've got the wrong slide here. Uh, some so soft side effects, postural hypotension, feeling dizzy when you stand up, very disabling, certainly after exercise. Just general achy joints, feeling stiff like an old man, fogginess of thought, which a lot of people have talked about earlier on this afternoon. Um, fogginess of vision and palpitations, all not very good, really. Probably the most significant for me was when I was on a, a cycling trip in um, Norway. I was cycling on my own and wild camping, and I uh, had a hypo in the night. Uh, so I, you always carry reserves as a type 1. I'm sure anyone with type 1 in the audience will, will know that. But on this particular occasion, I ran out. Um, I ran out of all of my food supplies at about 3 in the morning. And my sugar was only 2.4, and, and it felt like it. So I didn't quite know what I was going to do there. Uh, so I worked out that I'd get on my bike and cycle as close as I could to a road on the hope that I'd probably be found. So I did that, but um, as luck would have it, when I approached the road, there was a half-eaten sort of crust of bread, which was soggy, uh, but it sort of saved me, really. And I remember at that point, it was a bit like the purple rain moment you get when you're, when you're watching the cinema, you know, the, the thunder and lightning, and, and it's all over. And I remember thinking, I'm never going to control my diabetes. You know, I've tried really hard. I've just been cycling 60 miles a day for five weeks, and I haven't got a clue about how to... Uh, control it at all. That was assuming that I hadn't made a mistake, which I don't think I had. So for me, that was the final straw, really, in a whole series of near misses uh, over the years. I mean, I've had high posts when I've had a double barrel shotgun clay pigeon shooting. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't bear thinking about, really. I mean, I'm lucky to be here, I think. And I'm an active type. I like to do outdoor type sports, and I really couldn't see me continuing an active lifestyle in the future. And they do say, don't they, that People with chronic diseases often die at 70, but they don't get buried until they're 90. And I was genuinely start to think that this was, for me, the beginning of the end. Um, so for me, uh, keto was the last throw of the dice. And it really is a shame, I think, that it has to get that bad. Um, it's very difficult for people with diabetes because someone mentioned this morning that you, know, you have to be carefully managed to go keto. Sort of ironically, keto is easier to control uh, diabetes with. Um, and who's going to manage it? Because not many doctors you go to who's going to happily take you on to manage it. So it's, 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 it's difficult. But anyway, I had a go. And happily, things do change for the better. Um, lots of renewed sense of well-being. And only a few weeks ago, I'm 
I completed my first half marathon, which this first half marathon, um, you know, nothing Iron Man, just a half marathon. I didn't come first. I came about 9,000th. Uh, <laughs> but, but for me, it was significant because the first one I ran purely on the ketogenic diet and injecting insulin at the same time. So it was, it was quite a challenge. And uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> thank you. So how do, how do you do it? Well, make sure your sugar is pretty reasonable the night before. Uh, have a bacon and egg breakfast with a black coffee and then inject your long-acting insulin and also then inject some rapid-acting insulin, which I, I did an hour and a half before the race, four units only. Run your race uh, and everything went perfectly. Um, energy levels were high all the time, which is very unusual. Um, glucose levels were normal, relatively flat. I had no need to manage sugar throughout the whole of the run and I had no fear of a hypo. It was almost like being non-diabetic again, if I can remember that far back. And I've done half marathons before with a, ket with a non-ketogenic diet, and this was almost the exact opposite. Carb loading with the diabetes and then trying to get your insulin right is almost impossible. And most you know, anyone in the room with diabetes will know that often you're running high or a bit too low, and then you crash afterwards. It's very, very difficult. So I discovered there's an alternative method to managing type 1, and I hope in the near future that low-carb, high-fat is an option early on rather than a desperate attempt really to step back from the brink. It's no fun. And I want other people to have the knowledge so they can have the choice before they get to a place where they're running out of options. Um, so to do my bit to inform type 1s on keto, I'm preparing a conversion program which will hopefully go online in the next few months and it will at least give type 1s a safe place to start, give them a resource rather than guesswork. I am aware that low carb is but one approach. Some people do really well carbohydrate counting uh, and injecting insulin and that's great for them. But there are also plenty who uh, struggle with carb counting and low fat diets. Um, and I think for those people, there's huge potential, and they should uh, be at least made aware that carb counting is um, not the only method. And keto isn't a difficult diet to follow. It's, it's not a fatty diet for the precious. It's a type of low-carb, high-fat diet, as most of you know, that goes down to 50 grams or less. Most people are on about 30 to 40, probably. Um, my own view of this diet, if people are going to start it, is you should start it all at once. I think. You, in the same way as you can't do half a somersault, I don't think you can do half a keto initially um, because I think the metabolism of diabetes would favour uh, a complete break and I don't think it would be difficult to manage your sugars through that. But the good thing about keto is you can stop it at any time. It's not like being advised to take a statin or, or not um, or antihypertensive drug. If you don't like it, you can stop it. It's only two to three weeks and, and you, you should feel a lot better. But look at the bottom. Eating and choosing food becomes enjoyable again. It becomes less of a science and more fun. And you do get much easier control of your diabetes um, um, with a ketogenic diet. And I'll explain a bit about that later. Easier glucose control. I'm on a third less insulin than I was before, which is a huge amount of insulin if you think about it, isn't it? But I just want to talk about... Um, old Dean Ornish uses exactly the opposite diet to, to what I've been proposing here. But his four pillars of health is sort of guru, sort of um, guru genesis, really. Eat well, move well, relax well, and love well. So I'm not going to say it's um, a holistic lifestyle, but I think it isn't, uh, all of those um, dimensions are equally uh, valid. And I think if we have a good circle of friends, have plenty of laughs, learn how to relax, and do plenty of exercise. I think that all helps, and I think it is a, a lifestyle at the end of the day. So I'm just going now to talk about um, trailblazers. Has anybody heard of this guy? I think most people probably have. Yeah, he, he's very interesting, Richard Bernstein. He, he um, developed very bad complications of diabetes when he was in his 30s or so. He'd had it since the age of 12, and he, was, he had high um, blood pressure. He had neuropathy. He had a damaged ankle because of neuropathy, got a Charcot foot. He had retinopathy, uh, and he had protein in the urine. And he managed to get hold of one of the very first glucometers, which at those, in those days would have cost £5,000 today. And being a, an engineer making lab equipment, he had quite an analytical mind, and, and essentially he set up his own ketogenic diet. He told the American Diabetes Association, they patted him on the head, said, go away, suddenly we know what we're doing. So he became a doctor, and now he works in the university department. But he's, he's nearly 80 now, I think, or, or probably older. But he's still at work. He has 
had 30 years on 30 grams of carbs or less, and he has no deficiency state that he's aware of. So I think you can argue probably from that that carbohydrates aren't essential. And he's had diabetes for over 60 years, and insulin injections is complication-free. And this other guy you might or might not have heard of, sorry about the slide, Keith Runyon, exactly the same. He developed diabetes in adulthood. He's a kidney doctor in the USA, so he sees a lot of people with diabetes. Uh, Keith Runyon and uh, Elaine Davis. Yeah. And um, he, he did exactly the same. So I, I think it shows, really, that the carb, carb lifestyle uh, is, is safe, really. These, these doctors aren't crazy people. They're just very interested in trying to stop going to see doctors like themselves for advice later down the line. Um, and this is, this is some science for you. This is from Diabetology and Metabolic Syndrome. It's four years old now. Has anybody heard of this study? Probably, probably not. Um, 48 people with type 1 diabetes running a longitudinal study in Sweden, uh, gi given a diet of low carb, high fat, down to 75 grams or less. So that's low carb by anybody's standards, I think, isn't it? It's quite low carb. And over half, well, almost half, it's just one under half of the people completed the trial, which lasted four years. So it's a huge retention rate for a trial of this nature. And look, the HbA1c reduced by 16 millimoles per mole, or 1.5%, down to 6.4. And if you just, interesting, this is a bit more interesting than anything else. If you just look at these upswings here, that represents the absorption of sugar. And it's the same everywhere, look. And if you look at this going down, that represents the action of insulin. And clearly, the idea is to balance those up so you get a flat line. So the people who are then on ketogenic diet seem to be flattening out quite well at between 5 and 10 and probably very minimal hypos here. So I think that's a good, powerful study. And I'm surprised that um, that hasn't been talked about more by Public Health England because I think they could probably do, do well using that, don't you? Um, I just want to talk now a little bit about insulin and, and how we use it because it's fundamental to, to keeping me alive, really. Uh, insulin has many actions, but I want to concentrate today on the interaction between insulin and carbohydrate. Um, this is the axis, of course, around which um, current treatment revolves, and programs like Daphne, um, which is the sort of type 1 program, uh, is, is insulin and carbohydrate orientated. Um, Daphne, as you know, means dose adjustment for normal eating, and the normal here um, means high carbohydrate and low fat. Um, but it could mean anything. I mean, you could actually apply it to the ketogenic type diet, but of course we don't count carbs. I count um, protein, adrenaline, and cortisol um, when, when I'm working out my insulin doses. Um, and this is the totality of the evidence that the current diet for type 1s is the best diet for diabetes. <laughs> The, the diet recommended by Diabetes UK, um, NHS, um, British Dietetic Association, and NICE um, seems to have evolved really with the discovery of insulin, the phobia of fat, and the lazy extrapolation of the diet recommended for the non-diabetes population. And it, really, if you can't have fat, then you have to have more carbs, so the argument goes, doesn't it? And uh, so inevitably, diabetes is managed in a high carbohydrate environment. So here we have a condition of carbohydrate um, mismetabolism, and we're in, in managing it by adding in carbohydrates, which is very tricky, but some people do manage it. And the discovery of insulin saved lives, and, and I think people with type 1 needs to be um, very grateful for that. It revolutionized care in diabetes. Um, but now we have sophisticated insulins, sophisticated delivery systems, and saving lives he says arrogantly, is now routine. I think the challenge is preserving the quality of life. And we have the means of improving control. But I just want to make you aware of, of, of this, really. If you're taking insulin, then you need carbs. That sort of, we think, well, probably. Um, because insulin lowers sugar. If you get, put too much insulin in your body, you're going to have a low sugar, then you're going to need to rescue it with carbohydrate, aren't you? If you don't take enough insulin, you obviously have a high sugar level. Uh, and if you take too much insulin, you have a very low sugar level. But what if you have exactly the right amount of insulin? People with type 1 often manage by injecting a long-acting insulin and then cover their meals with short-acting insulin. So if you inject just the right amount of insulin, probably you don't need carbs. And I think 
we need to be more aware that we need to be injecting to meet the physiological needs of the body and not the carbohydrate excess, if you see what I mean. Not the dietary surplus. And that leads me on. If you're taking carbs, though, you definitely need insulin. Now, luckily, if you eat fat, by preference, you don't um, disturb any of that insulin sort of circuit, um, so your glucose levels don't go up. And, of course, if your, glucose, if your insulin isn't released and your glucose doesn't go up, you need less insulin. And if you need less insulin, you have smoother control. And you get less insulin resistance. Now, I'm quite, quite keen on this one. Insulin resistance. Well, if you think about it, if we're injecting more insulin than we need, in my case, a third too much, and you're then eating carbohydrates, it's slightly the other way around, isn't it? You eat your carbohydrates, then you inject your insulin. Are we not creating, really, the high carbohydrate, high insulin levels in the body, which is the hallmark of the metabolic disruption of type 2. And I think we are. I think the fact that I told you I injected my uh, short acting insulin an hour and a half before a run suggests I've got significant insulin resistance. And that is a complete and utter disaster, really, because type 1 is bad enough, but adding a whole metabolic uh, dishevelment into your body is, 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 is not good news. Um, of course, there's so much to learn, isn't there? Uh, we're, we're, we're getting there with, with, with diet, but um, renewed interest in low carb has only come about, really, because it's plain to pretty well everybody in the consulting room that the current strategy isn't working. Um, and we, it is unlikely, I think, though, that most research on dietary fat will have taken this into account. So I, I looked at one of the studies. I think it was the Oslo Heart Study, but I just cannot remember. But this was one that showed the benefit of reducing saturated fat in heart disease and it reduced the incidence of heart disease, not death. But all the researchers did was alter the fat ratios with the same percentage of fat in the diet. And of course, if you had the same percentage of fat, you had the same percentage of carbohydrates, which is 45%. And this was borne out again in a meta-analysis of other trials. So it's nothing like the high-fat diet that is being advocated in um, the ketogenic or low-carb diet. And I think it's a bit worrying because we might be all debating saturated fats, but we may not actually be talking about the same thing, if you see what I mean. Does that make sense? I think we're using the same words, but probably speaking a different language. And we need to be careful that we're not maneuvering into making statements of fat out of, about fat out of context. Uh, I just want to move on. How long have I got? Seven minutes. Okay, it's fine. Um, I just want to move on a little bit, very quickly, about, uh, about fats, because Zoe's already done everything about fat. Butyric acid is a saturated fat in butter, and butyric acid is named after butter, because a third of the saturated fat in butter is butyric acid. And butyric acid in the bowel seems to be protective against cancer of the colon, because the microbiome produces a lot of it. So here we have an example of a saturated fat that is actually thought to be protective against cancer. Is, I haven't got the reference, I'm afraid, but it, it, is, it is right. So, is, I mean, we've sort of gone past that argument throughout the day today. So, you know, is, is butyric acid harmful or not? Is butter harmful or not? I would suggest it probably isn't, wouldn't you? Uh, here we go. For us GPs, what about um, ketogenic diet and a low-carb, high-fat diet in the NHS? For us GPs, as, as David mentioned earlier on, there's wriggle room. We've now got permission to um, manage diet based on patient preference. Um, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so for patients and clinicians that are happy to use low carb, we can help them. But the problem is, a lot of us aren't skilled up in order to help them. So, I mean, I, I, I've just mentioned this for information, but I've prepared a half-day teaching session. I know other people are doing it elsewhere uh, on the theory and practice for low carb diets for GPs, um, practice staff, uh, and other clinicians in, interested in diabetes. And there's been a huge response. I mean, uh, two-thirds of the practices locally have, have, have shown an interest. So it's not all over yet. And I think, you know, once we can get people on board confident enough, at least when patients come to them and say, look, doc, I've got all this. I want to go on the ketogenic diet. I want to go on a low-carb diet. At least we'll, we'll know what we're talking about rather than just say, oh, it's too dangerous. Don't, don't even go there because, you know, you're going to get ketoacidosis or some nonsense, you know. If there's anybody there still believes that ketosis and ketoacidosis are the same, it isn't. It's only the letters that are the same. So, um, so I think really um, patients need to be helped because currently, no matter how many times people who are not very good at managing their diabetes try high, high carb and low fat, 
we won't get better outcomes. Uh, the basic assumptions are, in my view, wrong. We're making a disease worse just by trying to treat it. Um, and then trying to improve things by offering more of the same. Surely we must at least offer other evidence-based alternatives such as low-carb, high-fat. We cannot continue really to promote just one option that forces people who are struggling to find alternatives online. I think offering no advice whatsoever is better than what we're being asked to do at the present time. We've all signed up as doctors of the Hippocratic Oath which says first do no harm. Um, and, and, and that's what Joanne was alluding to, the duty of candor to patients. I mean, it'd be fascinating to see if the um, duty of candor extended to diet, because that, <laughs> that caused all sorts of problems, wouldn't it? Um, for those with diabetes, though, this isn't an intellectually sort of um, interesting debating topic when we are really talking about life and death. And the seemingly bizarre situation at present is that, as a GP, I can give what I personally believe to be the wrong advice but with the blessing of the state. But can I give what I and a growing number of clinicians believe to be good advice and expect the same warm blessings? Well, if you look at what's happening to Tim Noakes in South Africa at the moment, I doubt it very much. Uh, it is a dilemma, isn't it? But I think for me personally, it is unethical to offer just the current guidelines. And I think the internet's a great democratizing resource. We can all have our say, we can learn for ourselves, and we can follow all sides of the debate. Uh, and then it is up to in each individual to decide their own treatment and for us as clinicians to provide all the information to enable that decision. It is the patient's decision and not the clinician's decision after all. Uh, and I think one by one, and I think this is the way it's going to happen, people are realizing there's more than one option. They're going online, they're spreading the word through social media. And, and I think there will come a point in the not too distant future where official advice will become irrelevant if it doesn't adapt. Um, so. Oh, on time. I'll just finish off with... Um, I won't. Anyway, to summarise, really, there's more than one way of managing diabetes. We need to look at where ketogenic or low-carb, high-fat diet sits in the treatment options for diabetes. I think we need to review the use of insulin and carbs to take into account the metabolism. And I think we must train clinicians in low-carb, high-fat so they are confident they can meet the current guidelines provided by NICE. And I think we must also provide safe programs for patients who want to try keto. So it's really up to us. We've, we, we've got an opportunity at the moment to, to extend care to our patients should we choose to do so. I think we should take full advantage of it.